My name is Iris Gray Dowling, and I have written a book called uh, The Praying Mantis Disappearing Friend. And uh, you know what friend means. The praying mantis is our friend, but he is disappearing a lot. We don't see them in our yards like we used to. And so we have to learn more about the praying mantis so that we can save them so that they can help us more. Uh, this is the, the book that I have written, and you see the praying mantis here with his uh, four legs, and you see a good part of his body. But in any book in the library, you usually have a title page, and then you have a credits page, and then that tells uh, the title again, and also it tells the ISBN number, which is very important to the library, and also it tells the author's name and those who helped to work on the book. Here I have a picture of the praying mantis, just the head part, and you'll notice the antenna that are very important for the sensory parts, like they can see and hear and smell, and then notice the eyes. They're very, very large. That is important to the praying mantis because they can see insects in bushes way across from them. And then notice the mouth. They can uh, crush hard-shelled insects and eat them. So those parts are all very important to the praying mantis. This is also another picture of the title page. This, this picture shows the uh, classroom that where the uh, children are going to be talking about the praying mantis. So this story takes place in a small class setting with two teachers. You can see them here. Their name are Miss Newton and Miss Nelson. And the children's names are Brian, Sarah, Caleb, Sandy, and Maddie. And Brian couldn't wait for school to begin. He wanted to show Miss Newton what he brought. Miss Newton stood up to greet the class. I'm glad to see you're all back in school after such a long vacation. Do any of you remember the projects that I gave you to think about over the summer? Asked Miss Newton. Brian jumped up and waved his hand toward the teacher. Look, Miss Newton, I brought an egg case. And you can see it right here, and he has it in his hand, if you look carefully at the picture. And this is what it looks like. And he showed it to Miss Newton, and he said, she said, come up, Brian, and let us see what you have in your hand. And Sarah leaped back in her chair with fright, and she said, Brian, why did you bring that nest in here? Brian, what do you mean? It's not harmful, said Brian. Some bees might come out and sting us. Of course they won't, replied Brian. It looks like a little bee nest to me, said Sarah. My mother got the bee spray out when she saw one of those nests in our azalea bushes. Oh no, that would be the end of the baby praying mantises, sighed Brian. What do you mean baby praying mantises, asked Sarah. This is the praying mantis egg case said Brian, and if you look at very carefully, you can see that baby praying mantises come out of this part, they're in the egg case, and they come out of this part when they're ready to come out. So this is the, ba the praying mantis egg case. In the fall, the mother actually turns upside down like this and attaches herself to a branch and lays this frothy foam that comes from her body and the sticky foam hardens and holds the eggs inside the case. And she attaches it to the stem so that it will stay there when the winds blow and it won't fall on the ground usually. In the late spring, when the weather gets warmer, the baby praying mantids hatch out of the egg case, added Brian. You mean there is more than one praying mantis in that case, said Sarah? Even more than 101, replied Brian. Now I know you're joking, laughed Sarah. Oh no, that's for real, said Brian. Ha ha ha, laughed Sarah. 
100 praying mantises in that egg case, they could, it couldn't even fit in that little case. Sarah, you need to be close to watch the baby praying mantids crawling out all over each other, wiggling out, trying to get out of that case. Those babies are called nymphs. They look like their parents, but they're only a quarter of an inch long. Right here at the top of this page, you can see right up here at the very top, there's a tiny baby praying mantis that actually I found when it wasn't living. So I put it up there so that you could see the real one right there by my finger. Do you see it? Okay, that's what the size they are when they're coming out. They little bit, look a little bit bigger on this sheet, but I wanted you to see they're only about a quarter of an inch long when they come out of this egg case. You're right, Sarah, but nymphs are hungry. They need to find little insects like gnats and fruit flies to eat so that they can start growing. The nymphs grow from a quarter of an inch to over a half of an inch in a few weeks, and they shed their exoskeletons seven or eight times. Yes, that's the exoskeleton, said Miss Nelson. They have to shed that so that they can continue to eat. Now, do you see anything in this picture that they might eat? Yes, some little uh, flies and ants and fruit flies. Small things at first because they're very small, so they have to eat tiny insects. Now, Miss Nelson said this is what, look, what happens when they're very, very small, and then as they eat, they get larger. From a quarter of an inch to a half an inch to a little bit longer, they get bigger and bigger. And this uh, takes all summer for them to get that large so that when you see them in the fall, that's what they would look like. They have to shed their outer skin, which is the, ex the armor, and that is called molting. Brian said, I read on a website that the praying mantises are always hunting. They lift their head up high and they turn their neck around like that much more than we as humans can turn our neck. We can't turn it, but they can turn theirs all the way around back of them so that they can see in the bushes all the way around to find insects that they can eat for their dinner. The more they eat, the more they grow. Sometimes they can't find enough bugs, so something happens sadly, and that is that when they're babies, they eat each other, said Brian. That's right, class, said Miss Newton. The ones you see in the bushes have eaten living insects and molted eight or ten times. If you look outside about a month later, you might see a praying mantis that grew quite a few inches as we saw on this paper. Sorry, I had the wrong one. On, yes, on this paper. <laughs> now the praying mantis has spiny legs in the front. I'll show you another picture later of the spiny legs. But sometimes they eat insects that we really wouldn't want them to eat. Like this one has a butterfly and he's holding it very tight and he's, and he's eating the butterfly and sometimes they do that. So they eat a lot of harmful insects though and so we're very happy that they help us in that way. Is it true that praying mantids bite people sometimes, asked Sarah? They don't bite unless someone tries to harm them or take them away from their insect dinner, said Brian. Are you telling me that the insect dinner is that important to them, asked Caleb. Sure, just like meat and bones are important to your dog, insects are important to the praying mantis, replied Brian. Now you understand why the praying mantis is so important to us. I read that they hunt day and night and catch those annoying insects like flies and mosquitoes. They hold them with their tiny, their two spiny front legs, and the spines can hold the prey so tight 
that it can't, ex can't escape, added Brian. Now here's a picture of some of those insects that are annoying to us, like the housefly and the spiders, mosquitoes and uh, mites and ticks and some of the insects that are annoying to us. And this word down here says prey because that is what these are to the praying mantis is the word is the prey. They are called his prey or what the insects that he eats. So the praying mantis eats many kinds of insects that help to protect us. I also brought a collection of insects that I have collected, uh, have found when they weren't living. So I put them in this collection so that you could see them. Here's the praying mantis and the egg case. And up here you can see June bugs. And I think I have this upside down. You can see um, Japanese beetles and all different kinds of beetles, mosquitoes, house flies, fireflies and even the butterfly and and here is a cicada and we have heard a lot about the cicada coming this summer and praying mantises will even help to uh, eat and kill the the cicada which will be very helpful to us because cicadas destroy some of our trees and there's also the um, spotted lanternfly that comes and destroys some of our fruit trees and the praying mantis will also help to control the spotted lanternfly. So in that way, he, it, they are our friends. These pictures show a lot of the insects. Again, how he's holding them with his uh, forearms and the moths and the centipedes and thousand leggers, you might call them or uh, cicadas, and uh, again, mosquitoes, and down here, even stink bugs. We, had, we have quite a few stink bugs that annoy us also, and they even get the stink bugs and other kinds of beetles and some bees. And here is another set of pictures with the praying mantis in the middle of them. Here's the praying mantis on all of the kinds of insects that they would eat. Many different kinds of beetles down here. And I painted this picture to show you the other, some other insects like the caterpillars and, and uh, uh, the grasshoppers and some other uh, annoying insects that we have in this picture. You're kidding, praying mantises really catch and eat all those insects, said Caleb. Oh yes, Caleb, they don't waste what they catch, said Brian. They also eat spiders, grasshoppers, bees, caterpillars, and even tree frogs. Once I saw a praying mantis eating a stink bug on our back porch. Well, here's a picture of the porch and the praying mantis and the stink bugs. What? You actually saw the mantis bite into a smelly stink bug, said Caleb. Yes, I saw the big mantis biting into the stink bug's hard shell. I bet it looked fat after that dinner, laughed Caleb, as the whole class giggled. Let's be serious, said Brian. Here is something you ought to know. I saw some of the other stink bugs get off the screen door and disappear when the praying mantis walked around. You mean the insects were afraid of her? Asked Sandy. You guessed it. They didn't want to be the next dinner. So they were running away while the praying mantis was there. And when the praying mantis left, they got back on the screen door. So they knew to be away, to get away from the praying mantis. Now, Miss Newton, May I let everyone touch the egg case now, asked Brian. Yes, certainly, Brian. So Brian talked to his classmates as he walked around, letting each one touch the yellowish egg case that he had in his hand. Here it is, you can see it in the bush. He reminded them that the mother praying mantis laid the eggs and put the foam around them. 
And as the foam got hard, the egg case stuck to the stiff branch, like this one is stuck to the branch here. And when the leaves die and drop, then you can see the cases a little clearer, said Brian. My mother told me that gardeners usually clean their flower beds and gardens after we have frost. She said people need to be careful not to throw away the egg cases along with the trash because then the uh, praying mantis egg cases will go in the trash and then we won't have them in our yards. And you know, I have a Christmas tree story that I've heard many times and that is that uh, people go get their Christmas tree at the Christmas tree farm and then they bring it home and put it in the corner and decorate it and then they get some presents that they didn't expect to get. The next morning when they get up, there are a bunch of little praying mantises all over the tree and all around the room. You know what happened? They hatched because of the warm room and they didn't realize that the egg case was in the Christmas tree. And you know, something happened to me as a teacher in school. I had the praying mantis egg case to talk to the children about and laid it on the shelf. And when they went home, I also went home later that evening, came back the next morning, and there were little praying mantises all over the whole window uh, area of the schoolroom. And so when the children came, we had to get our hands and scoop the egg, uh, the little baby praying mantises up and take them out in the yard so that they could get some insects. Maybe they could find some little insects in the grass. So we have to be careful that we don't put them in a warm place when it's not time for them to hatch. But some people put them in their uh, refrigerator over the winter sometimes and then bring them out in the spring and put them out where they can hatch. So if you don't want little praying mantises all over your house, you don't lay it someplace in your house where it's warm or where the sun's shining because they will hatch out. And, and I remember I told you a little while ago that there could be hundreds that come out of one egg case, this one little egg cage could have hundreds of praying mantises that come out of it. Here is a picture that I painted to show you more insects that the praying mantis eats. Uh, this is one that I'm going to give to some of you to, to uh, make your own picture. Now, sometimes praying mantis, we see different colored praying mantises, like green ones, or brown ones, and uh, Sarah is asking the question. She said, I saw green ones and brown ones. Doesn't that have something to do with where they live or they grow? Well, Sandy said, I read in my science book that color protects animals from their enemies or their predators. Predators is another word for enemies, someone that destroys uh, another insect. Don't scientists call that camouflage, asked Sandy. Well, that's why God made these insects so that they could change different colors to wherever they are. If you notice, this one has a, has a lot of green in the background, and that helps to protect it from, from its enemies seeing it. And this one is kind of on something brown and looks a little bit brown. And that's called protective coloration because they kind of change the color to look like their surroundings and that helps to protect them. Sometimes the egg cases do fall on the ground and that is not a good place for the egg cases because inside of the egg case, the eggs are kind of sweet to some animals. They taste like sugar. So praying mantises do have enemies. They have to hide from birds, skunks, snakes, and even your household pets, said Miss Newton. This book mentions that ants love the foamy stuff in the egg case because it's sweet like sugar. They devour it up and eat all the babies that they can, and then we don't have any baby praying mantises. Even bigger predators like birds 
are watching for an egg case. And they don't even have to get it when it's on the ground. They can get it when it's in the bushes, because I've watched them from my house get some of the egg cases. Even bigger predators like raccoons uh, eat several egg cases. Brian, have you heard of a way that we can protect the egg cases from these predators? There are, there's a little mouse down here. Mouse, they even like the egg cases and the ants. And here's a snake. Even snakes like them. So how can we protect them from them? So this was Brian's idea. Here's the egg case that was put in the bush by the mother and is sticking on the branch. But this one fell down. So I know for sure that we shouldn't pull the egg cases off the stems. The mother tried to stick them in a safe place like this one. If we find a nest on the ground or near the ground, we could get a little piece of netting like from around a vegetable or something that your mother got uh, some vegetables or fruit in that in the store and you could save that netting. And Brian said, I got a piece of that and then I got a twister and I put the egg case in that netting and fastened it to the shrub or the plant two or three feet above the ground. Well, that's a good idea. We want to be sure that we are that we help these insects like the praying mantis to help to get rid of the pests so that they don't destroy the praying mantis and the, the these other predators that destroy our gardens. We need to help the gardeners and the farmers produce more healthy food, said Miss Newton. Brian told us what we could do. Now, can the rest of you think of what you could do to help? Here's a picture of the, of the praying mantis and the word praying at the bottom is how we spell the word praying mantis. And the reason it got that name is because if you notice its front forelegs, it looks like it's praying. So that's how they gave it the name of praying mantis with an A. But actually it does more of uh, praying on animals, like um, this word, praying with an E, because it is catching its prey. But we still use the word praying mantis and spelled like this. This picture shows the different parts of the praying mantis. It's four legs, and as you can see the spiny four legs that it has here to hold the insects. You can see its head and its eyes. So it has three parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. An abdomen is like, your, like the stomach, and it's, it has a stomach. Similar systems to what we have in our body. And of course, the eyes are very prominent and the mouth and the antenna are up here, and these four legs. Then it has four other legs, and it has uh, two sets of wings, but it doesn't fly. It flies just, the uh, male flies just a little bit from one uh, bush, bush to another, but it doesn't fly very far. So it, the main important thing is that it has the waves in order to get insects. Now, I mentioned a while ago about the uh, baby praying mantises. This is a very important picture and would, would be very, very hard to find. Actually, it's, there are two stones off of my barn wall and my great granddaughter happened to see something there and came in and told me about it and I went and got my camera. <clears throat> and if you look right there, you can see a baby praying mantis. And up here is another baby praying mantis. Can you see them? Now I have another thing here for you. Any of you who come into the library, this is a bookmarker with the picture that I just showed you about the praying mantis. And it says on the back of the bookmarker, look and listen and for the, your insect friend, fa, friends. And 
Get your camera. You're always carrying your cameras around and snap a picture of them, but don't harm them. Then you could make notebooks uh, like I have a notebook here. You could make notebooks of your pictures, put the dates and the time that you took the picture and tell some different facts that you learned about the insect in your book. And then you could have your collection in your notebook a lot longer than I can keep this collection in the box. So you can help to make collections so that you can learn a lot from the praying mantis. So if you come into the library, they will give you one of these bookmarkers. And also I made a picture in black and white for you. And you can have one of these pictures to color. And it says up here, draw what I will eat. So there's a big space down here for you to draw the pray, the, what the praying mantis eats. And you've learned a lot of things from this story. And also, if you go out and look in your yard, you might find a lot of things that you could draw in those pictures. Oxford Library wants to give a great big thank you to Iris for coming in and teaching us all about the praying mantis. It was pretty cool, huh? You can step on into the library and pick up a picture of the praying mantis in Iris's book to color and to draw what it's about to eat, as well as a bookmark from Iris's book that you can use to um, keep place in other books that you're gonna read. You can also stop in and pick up Iris's other books that we have available here at Oxford, both nonfiction about other bugs and animals and fiction books. She's a very talented writer, huh? So once again, thank you, Iris, for coming in and thank you for watching. Now, go look for some bugs. Bye.